In the previous video to this one, we looked at the arguments and evidence given by Gerald Massey that a literalistic, hierarchical, church, historic Christianity, he calls it, that believes in a historic Jesus, and that he lumps under the name of Peter, came in and usurped the esoteric and what he calls Gnostic spirit of texts and documents that were floating around, such as the letters attributed to someone calling himself Paul. And we talked about how that name Paul could be related to Apollo, just like Saul becomes Paul, a Gnostic teacher who was not talking about a literalistic, historical Jesus, but about something completely different. And that this new, hierarchical, literalistic, historic Christianity, believing in a historic Jesus, and saying if you don't believe in a literal, external, historic Jesus, you will go to eternal damnation in hell. So it was also a traumatizing religion, and one that was talking about, oh, the world will end imminently. It's about to end, which is also a traumatic teaching. So you better start listening to us, because the world's going to burn up in fire pretty soon trauma. And also, if you don't listen to us and believe in the historic Jesus, the literal Jesus that we're talking about, then you will go to eternal hellfire, also traumatizing. This new interpretation that was 180 degrees out from what the letters of Paul were teaching came in and turned all those teachings upside down and then actually had the, the gall to say, that Paul was teaching the same thing, to co-opt Paul's message and try and turn it into a support for their message, which was 180 degrees out. We looked at those arguments, and although I don't agree, like I said, with everything that Gerald Massey ever wrote or said, I agree with that general perspective on what happened. Something came in and took these ancient texts or ancient stories or stories that were based on this ancient system and that were esoteric and turned them into something 180 degrees out. And so today I want to just emphasize my analysis and study of the ancient myths for the past 13 years. It has shown beyond doubt that they are based on an esoteric celestial metaphorical system, a system in which the figures in those stories, the gods and goddesses, or the figures of warriors and princes and princesses and queens and kings, those are based on celestial figures, on constellations, and they use the heavenly cycles, and they're part of a code that is teaching an esoteric system, and that system has at its heart two really important concepts that are tied together. One is the recovery of self. What does that mean? Modern cutting-edge healers explain that trauma, psychological trauma, can be defined as separation from self, an actual separation from our own higher self or authentic self, I like to say our deeper self, and the myths are dramatizing that. They can be shown to have that as a central theme. That's why there's so much twinning in myths around the world. There's sets of twins, and one twin will almost always be divine or semi-divine. That is a higher self figure. It's not two different people. It's a picture of us divided from our own self. And we see that in stories around the world, Castor and Pollux in the myths of ancient Greece, or Hunapu and Ishbalanke in the sacred traditions of the Maya in Central America. But we find it around the world. We find twinning, and we find this, we find it in Enkidu and Gilgamesh in one of the most ancient texts that we still have today from ancient Sumer and ancient Mesopotamia. It is talking about recovery of self and trauma, healing of trauma, because recovery of self and healing of trauma go together. 
that's one of their central themes. And then there's this related theme that I haven't talked about maybe as much, but I have talked about it actually quite a bit, of opposing oligarchy or oligarchy. You can pronounce it either way. Oligarchy, oligarchy. The ancient myths can be shown to be against oligarchy. And you can see that in many different places. You can see it in the Odyssey. One of my favorite ancient texts is the Odyssey. And in the Odyssey, the gods themselves are just appalled at the behavior of the suitors. And the suitors are basically just parasites who are living off of other people's wealth. And so I argue that the Odyssey, it's very ancient. It's ancient Greece, but it's really, it predates what we think of as classical Greece. Classical Greece is typically thought of around 500 BC or BCE and forwards from about 500 to 300, maybe all the way up to, you know, the time of Alexander the Great of Macedon basically ends classical Greece. But the Odyssey and the Iliad are much earlier than that, and they are opposed to oligarchy. And a scholar and economist that you've heard me refer to a lot and who is, I believe, one of the most important voices that you can listen to today in terms of what's going on in the world, but also he's very focused on the ancient world, is Professor Michael Hudson. And he goes back to antiquity and he talks about how there was a struggle with oligarchy in classical Greece. There was this constant back and forth. But the ancient texts of ancient Greece are against oligarchy. And he points out, this is a book called Collapse of Antiquity. This is his latest book. And I'm really excited about it. I haven't read the whole thing. But in here, he talks about how the Delphic Oracle, the Oracle at Delphi, which is very ancient, it lasted for at least eight centuries until it was finally shut down when the literalist Christians took over the Roman Empire. But the Oracle at Delphi stretches way back into antiquity. It's, it predates classical Greece. And it was also against use of debt to take away people's lands and build up oligarchs who would gobble up the wealth of others and then just live off of, you know, basically putting other people into debt. So the ancient myths are against oligarchy and they are for the healing of trauma and for the recovery of self. And in The Collapse of Antiquity, Michael Hudson doesn't really talk about the stories of Jesus being celestial and metaphorical. So I'm not implying that he does. He actually treats Jesus as a literal figure, but he recognizes that Jesus is talking about forgiveness of debts and that the Sermon on the Mount is about some economic principles that are anti-oligarchy and anti-oligarchs using debt to gobble up other people's lands. That's what forgive them their debts was about. It's about an economic principle of anti-oligarchy. And so he points out that when literalist Christianity, he doesn't call it that, but he, the Roman hierarchical Christianity, and he especially points to two figures, Cyril and Augustine, or Augustine, and he says that Augustine was the real villain who took those texts and turned them on their head, the ones that are anti-oligarchy, and said, no, 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 they're not about anything economic. They're actually about just personal sin. It has nothing to do with any economic program. And so in the collapse of antiquity, when he's talking about this battle between the ancient understanding of forgiveness of debts and prevention of oligarchy and the new concept of no, oligarchy is okay. In fact, oligarchy is good. He shows how figures like Augustine, who was definitely a literalist, he was a key figure in this takeover of hierarchical literalist Christianity, turned the texts that were floating around, such as the ones where 
we have this figure Jesus talking about forgive them their debts turn those on their head and turn them into meaning something completely different he says Augustine's focus on original sin and not on how property maldistribution causes poverty Augustine's concept of Christian morality was limited to personal sinfulness and selfishness not the creditor power and landlord monopoly that earlier Roman historians described as destroying the Republic. Personal sins could be forgiven, but not debt. So Augustine took these texts that talked about forgive them their debts and turned it into, well, that has to do with, you know, forgive us our, you know, sexual immorality and has nothing to do with forgiving debts and returning land to debtors who had lost it to creditor oligarchs. And so it's a very important argument to understand that literalist Christianity, it turns the ancient world on its head. I've argued and I can demonstrate with abundant evidence that the world's ancient system is against oligarchy and against trauma. It's for the healing of trauma and recovery of self. Those two on an individual level, recovery of self, and on a societal level, opposition to oligarchy and indebting everybody. And yet when literalist Christianity comes in, it actually can be shown to support oligarchy at every turn, right from the beginning. Here we have Augustine turning these texts on their head to make sure that you can't use them to oppose oligarchy and also as we saw with the Gerald Massey arguments using the arguments of Paul turning those on their head and saying if you don't believe in a literal Jesus you're going to go to eternal hellfire that's trauma and by the way the end of the world is near so you better start paying attention this is urgent uh, urgent that you accept Jesus right now because the world's about to end. Use of trauma. So literalism turns the system on its head and instead of opposing oligarchy, supports oligarchy. And it has consistently, even up to the modern era, you can see that basically literalist Christianity supports oligarchy and also inflicts trauma inflicts trauma. And so we have this struggle going on between oligarchy and opposition to oligarchy. And I would argue that the modern era coming out of feudalism, so when, when the Roman Empire collapsed, Michael Hudson argues that the Roman Empire is like a failed state. And the reason it's a failed state is because of oligarchy and use of debt out of control and the reason why he's talking about it right now is he's saying it's very similar to what we have going on today. Runaway oligarchy and runaway debt and indebting everybody. That's what caused the Roman Empire to collapse. And I would argue that literalist Christianity was a huge component in that. A deliberate destruction, implosion, like a controlled demolition of the Roman Empire in order to usher in feudalism and serfdom. And then when you start having modern economists like the French physiocrats in the 1600s and then the, later the French Revolution opposing feudalism and saying, hey, let's put an end to this rentier, feudal, landlord, serfdom you have a modern struggle against oligarchy and during that struggle literalist Christianity and the Roman Catholic Church and other literalist denominations have consistently sided with oligarchy. So what I would say is very interesting and to tie this together to conspiracy theory is that conspiracy theory is pointing out actually the use of trauma to support oligarchy. What I would argue is going on, the things that people are pointing to when they're investigating 
suspicious events like the murder of John F. Kennedy, the murder of Robert F. Kennedy, the murder of Martin Luther King. Those events should be seen in light of this struggle against oligarchy and the struggle for proponents of oligarchy, <laughs> the struggle by oligarchs basically to not let their oligarchy slip away. That's how you should understand those events. Those events, September 11th, need to be seen in light of this centuries-long struggle. And it is a centuries-long struggle of imposing oligarchy through the use of trauma that is still going on today. And the ancient wisdom was against oligarchy and for the healing of trauma. The opposite of that is imposing oligarchy through the use of trauma. Literalist Christianity has a history that's connected to that struggle and we still see it going on today. And these events that are so suspicious should be seen in light of this oligarchy question and trauma question. You can view conspiracy, and I've talked about this a little bit in, for instance, my analysis of Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Inglorious Bastards, under the rubric of the use of trauma, the Manson murders, and the way they were used to attack the hippie movement and to defuse the hippie movement, which was the hippie movement was an opposition to oligarchy. It was saying, hey, let's remake society a different way. And that was seen as dangerous. And trauma was used, traumatic events and manipulation were used to oppose that and help prevent the threat to the oligarchical system. So if you understand oligarchy and trauma, that will shed light on current events and conspiracy, suspicious events as well. You have to understand them in light of this struggle, this centuries-long struggle that involves oligarchy and the deliberate imposition of trauma, the use of trauma. Thank you so much for listening. Hello. Hi there. Yeah? What did you think of that? Did you like that? Was I right? Yeah.